Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the campus-wide leadership series for March. I have some announcements. Uh, I'll have to introduce Dr. Norman. That's the most important thing. Uh, but next month's speaker, Tammy Greenberg, CEO of Ronald McDonald House, is here, and uh, she'll be speaking next month. The Bill and Joe Show. So Coach Self and Joe Carter are back on the schedule for June 15th. It was the only date that they would give Marty, and we took it. So um, there's a Board of Regents meeting that day, Dr. Gerard. I, I don't know what we're going to do, but <laughs> hooky is on my list. <laughs> I'm also supposed to announce there's an academic day. First, I hate when people say first annual, but OK. <laughs> Hopefully it'll go on. It's the first annual academic day, May 6, 2016. This is a um, first attempt at getting all the schools together in one place. There's a poster session. Uh, there are announcements going out. Uh, there's an interprofessional preceptor summit, which is for a specific group. But there will be awards for faculty uh, that have been announced and uh, being reviewed. And uh, it's just something that uh, we're trying out of our Office of Academic Affairs. So, how did I do, Marty? I remembered everything? Because you wrote it out on a pink piece of paper for me. That's good. <laughs> so, it's uh, a pleasure to introduce someone that uh, I think most of us uh, know. And there's a very long biography here. And uh, Dr. Norman, he, he knows I'm going to come up with something creative. Uh, when, you, when you read his biography, it's pretty obvious he's a Renaissance man, has had uh, more careers uh, than I can imagine in terms of different things. But for me, he's been an incredibly good colleague and a go-to guy when I needed something and, and needed to find out some information or needed a difficult situation to work through, whether it was just something in the office or something between university and, and hospital. Um, the best story is uh, we actually, this sounds awful, shared a lamb um, for dinner. <laughs> it wasn't a whole lamb, uh, but uh, his daughter uh, was raising organic vegetables and organic lamb, I guess. And I decided I needed half of that lamb. Uh, unfortunately, Lee took most of the abuse. I think the lamb uh, did not want to go to the butcher shop very much. and. Uh, and literally kicked the crap out of him. So, <laughs> but the lamb was great. So, in any case, uh, please welcome Dr. Norman. Need to get wired for sound here first. So I can move around a little bit. But I want to be clear. This wasn't like one of those little lambs around the neck of Jesus kind of lamb. <laughs> This thing was about 100 pounds, and it kicked me in the thigh, and that took a year to get better. So I hope that lamb stuck in your throat. Uh, <laughs> well, it was first off, great to see so many wonderful colleagues. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. Thanks for coming. You must have thought Bill Self was coming today. Uh, <laughs> but he's otherwise occupied, I'm told, today. Uh, the, uh, what I decided to do, I've, this, I've never given this talk before, uh, and I thought it would be fun to try something a little new and to have some fun because, you know, our life is too serious, we work too hard, and I've learned a few things along the way, and uh, this is going to be more of a photo journalism uh, ep episode for you than it is a pedantic lecture. So just let's have fun. And feel free, if you have thoughts, questions, your own vignettes to add, please do. The uh, why in uniform, one, I've learned if Marty asked me, she asked the state surgeon to show up, and the state surgeon is a military and slash civilian position, so I decided I'd better do that. The second is I wanted to point out something that some of you know, some of you don't. And that is, since 1991, during Desert Storm, 70% of the troops that have been in the Middle East and Afghanistan are National Guard and Reserve troops. Only 30% since 1991 have been uh, active duty troops because the, the, the government has pulled down during those years the number of active duty troops. It's just what it is. But I think that uh, you see my affiliation with the Army National Guard. They had to, I can assure you, make an age waiver 
for somebody to enlist at the age of 61, that would be me. And, um, uh, and I think we, it's really important that we continue to give the attention to our National Guard and our reservists be, and, and our active duty, because we're all in this together. But let me go through some fun stuff. <clears throat> what I want to talk about today, without hanging myself too badly here, is that life has and provides us with leadership lessons every single day. They're handed to us on a silver platter, and we have to be receptive. This is a young Lee Norman, very alert to see everything that there was out there. I was a third son, still am, <laughs> all these years later, the third son, and so there's almost no pictures of a third child, let alone a third son, I assure you. So that was the one that I had. Uh, but you have to be alert to see the leadership lessons around you, and they are everywhere. And despite the fact, and you may have seen that I have a couple management degrees and I've been a doctor for only 35 years, give or take, the, uh, I think the most valuable things that have stuck with me are the leadership lessons that we learn through life every single day. But we have to be receptive to them. And I'm going to share a few of those with you today because they're so fun. Okay, I am the offspring of two people. This man is my dad, and the mom in the middle there, I mean, sorry, the woman in the middle is my mom. Some things must be said. Um, the, the, both of these call out for a certain explanation. <laughs> <laughs> One is, of course, what you're thinking, what do you notice about this guy? And the answer is, with all that fabric, it's still a Speedo. <laughs> and <laughs> so obviously I didn't learn any sense of modesty from my father. No, actually, the reason you notice that is he only has one leg, or at least uh, he, he, uh, he's an amputee from his knee down on his left leg. My dad was at the, he's the son of, a, of a Dutch immigrants, born and raised on a kind of a, I won't be pejorative, uh, a river town in uh, Iowa, Clinton. And he toddled across this street as a four year old and got run over by a train and lost his leg. I'm glad he survived to the age of procreation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he taught me something I didn't want to become. He did teach me tenacity. He taught me hard work. He taught me that you can become an NCAA All-American swimmer at the University of Iowa with one leg. He was actually a two-time All-American. Big Ten captain and set multiple NCAA records for breast and butterfly, and he did it with one leg. That, that's a certain tenacity. What I had to unlearn from this very nice man is that I, when I went to medical school, I, I had to learn when people came in complaining of symptoms, you know, I, I, it was my inclination to say, Shh, that's nothing. Uh, <laughs> you come back with one leg, then we're gonna talk. Uh, because it, I had to unlearn that you don't have to be tough. You can be softer. You can listen. You can be empathetic. It, because when I remember my sister Gretchen, she was born many years later. My mom was pregnant with her 13 years later. And she, I'm doing this because my mom had the white, as white of hair as I when she was pregnant with my sister Gretchen. The three of us boys referred to her very kindly because it was a, you know, she was in her mid-40s. The knocked up grandma, we called her. <laughs> but uh, she, uh, I don't think that helped anything. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, did, we did learn to, I think, soften up a bit. And I, I had to unlearn that tendency to be kind of hard headed when it came to being empathetic to people. And I think I got there finally. My mom is not a Plains Indian. She, <laughs> she was the homecoming queen of Pocahontas high school in Pocahontas, Iowa. And uh, so if you notice, she's not very happy about that outfit she's wearing. <laughs> it was a god awful looking thing. But uh, she taught uh, tolerance and forbearance even for gosh awful clothing like that. But, um, and some of you will know what, I'm, what this means. These are, so, this is soap from my bathroom. And the, the lesson here is and what you don't know, or maybe you can't figure out, although some of you do this. Yeah. Ah, okay, how many do this without, yeah, okay, we got about 18%. Um, 
what you do when you get near the end of a bar of soap is you put it on another one and then you put it on another one and it eventually melds in and then you use it all so you're trend gently on the earth. And every day when I pick up this soap that looks pretty much like that uh, is I'm reminded that my dad taught me a very important lesson which was to be frugal and to live within your means. And the reason I bring that up, it sounds like an old platitude, and uh, I have to say before we get too far that my platitudes are better than other people's platitudes, so you're just going to have to bear with them. But um, <laughs> the, um, what I learned from this about being frugal, and, I, and again, I use this soap every day, and I think of it every day, which is you always live within your means so that nobody else controls you. That way, when you want to take risks, the risks are not so great. When you want to have fun, which means taking risk, the risks are not so great. And I've always, I've always tried to keep low debt. Even when I had no means, I lived within my means. And this is something I learned from my dad, and uh, I'm very grateful. Interestingly, his parents didn't have much yeah, main money, and he didn't have a leg to stand on. Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of one-legged jokes in my family. He was, uh, if you ever need a list of one-legged jokes, just <laughs> ask me. The, um, he, uh, they didn't buy him a leg for 10 years because he didn't have any money. Because he said, Hugh, you're just going to outgrow it. So he was on crutches for 10 years. I have a hunch that had, had something to do then with his upper body strength, which was significant. And, he, and again, I said he became a two-time All-American swimmer. So bully for him. Okay. I have a lot of pictures I've taken that, through my travels here and there. Leadership. I think one of the things that, as leaders, we feel always pressure to do something and to, you know, to be decisive and to be immediate. And, and in reality, I think what we need to do more often than not is to, to stand down a little bit how to think about being a leader. When I'm hearing something, how to think about what's being asked, how to be. What is being, what do I need to be in this instance? And then finally, what do I do? Because you know, this is not quick draw McGraw stuff for the most part. We can, we mostly, when it comes to substantive things, we can indulge ourselves even just a little bit to think about it rather than to have to necessarily shoot from the hip. The thing I like about PowerPoint is that I can be taller and thinner <laughs> because you can stretch it or you can do that. <laughs> hey, it's not that much thinner. Um, Although that is me, 40 years ago. Um, I got a, uh, it was in, uh, I guess it was 73, that was when we had a draft lottery. Uh, they did away with student deferments. Some of you are nodding your head, which means you're dating yourself by understanding this. The, uh, the student deferment for the, during the Vietnam War went away and the, the getting pulled in, Dr. Gerard knows this, um, was based on a, when our birthday came out of a lottery. And mine was number seven, the only lottery I've come close to winning in my lifetime, unfortunately. <laughs> so I decided to go ahead and enlist in the Air Force. So that was, uh, that was a couple years after I enlisted in the Air Force. That was probably 1977. And ironically, I, this is at Camp Bullis uh, out in uh, East Texas. I was, I was there 40 years ago for survival training. That's what that was. I was the guy who took the picture was Mark Swedenberg. He's an orthopedist in Detroit. And I had just climbed a tree and threw a possum down because we... Well, we're trying to survive, which means eating things. And he, he was down there poised with a big club to beat it with, and he missed. And, the, and possums are fast, actually, so he escaped. So that picture was taken. Then I ate Mark Swedenberg, like, right after that because I was so <laughs> dang hungry. <laughs> no, just kidding. He's still practicing in Detroit. Um, but I, um, so I was, this, I was also in the Air Force. I was a flight medicine doctor. I was, an, I was trained in aerospace medicine, so I took care of pilots and astronauts and, uh, and helped select and train pilots and astronauts, which was really quite interesting. The one on the left here uh, is a guy named Jim Williams, and he must have had somebody else's space suit on because it's a, it looks like a Swedish patch on his left arm, but I know that's Jim Williams. He's a guy I've known for many years. I was involved with way back then. He's an underachiever. He's a... A uh, fighter pot, he's Canadian, but that, that, that doesn't have anything to do with being an underachiever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. he, uh, he's a uh, fighter pilot, vascular surgeon, astronaut. Uh, but besides that, he was a very calm guy. Um, but he, uh, 
he, he did two spacewalks. And both times he was absolutely untrained to do what he did. One time was when the, uh, what do you call it, the tiles came off the outside, and he had to, they had to fashion a wrench, and he had, he had to go out on a spacewalk. He knew how to do a spacewalk, but there was two engineering things that he did not know how to do. So he went out there and did it, and fixed them. He has arrived safely, and he's doing fine. And what I learned, uh, both as a flight surgeon and from my friend Jim, was in a situation, particularly the more difficult situation, uh, you ask yourself two questions. And that is, what is the situation asking of me? Because sometimes as leaders and team members, we feel such pressure to be everything, to be all things to all people, or whatever. So I think, number one, what is the situation asking of me? And sometimes it's to nod your head and say, yeah, that sounds great. I think that's a wonderful way to go. Uh, Self-awareness, what, I mean, sorry, situational awareness, what is being asked of me? And then the second one is probably a more difficult one for many of us. We have to slow down, let our breathings, heart rate slow, and say, how am I going to do in this situation? What's being asked of me? What do I bring to the party? What do I don't bring to the party? If you can answer those two questions, you're going to be fine. Because this, the self-awareness uh, is like you need to call in a friend. You need to have your team members. You, you say, I've got blind spots. It, it means you're probably going to be a little bit more transparent. That means you understand yourself, you know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and where to go for some help. Ask yourself those situations, in, in, in any situations where you feel that certain tension to be a leader. Situational and self-awareness. Okay, I'm going out on a limb here because this is a, this is, you're going to think this is weird. Um, but I have three things to say. One is about schizophrenia. One is about how to sex chickens. And what I mean by that is how do you determine the sex of newborn chicks? <laughs> and the third is what do sumo wrestlers have to do with any of this? Anybody can link that together. Um, um, I was a social worker before I went to medical school, which I think is excellent training, by the way. And um, I worked with a psychiatrist named Howard Reed up in Minnesota. He had a big handlebar mustache from, he was a West Texan, we misplaced. And we worked out in uh, a five county, mostly rural health system doing uh, counseling, I'll call it. And uh, when I said to Howard once, I was getting my you know, feet wet in social work, I bet she went to medical school, obviously. I said, Howard, how do you diagnose schizophrenia? What, implying, what is the criteria? What are the criteria used to diagnose schizophrenia? That's a pretty good question. I was a newbie. And he said, I smell them. And I said, <laughs> what do you mean by that, Howard? Um, and he said, no. He said, it, he said, I don't literally smell them. Um, he said, but you, you just, you, you can sit back and just watch. They have a different facial expressions. They move differently. They, when they start talking, there's certain things. He said, if you just watch before you start applying any of your criteria, before you get into your DSM, whatever the number manual is now, and start going through there, he said, just watch, just observe. You just have to smell them. And he meant that figuratively, obviously, I think. Um, OK, point number two, sexing chickens. You were there. I think you were there, too. <laughs> yeah. They thought I'd lost my mind, these, these guys. About just confirmed it. Just confirmed yeah. it. Thank you, Dr. Gerard. It was, uh, it was in this building about three years ago, give or take. And there was a guy here from some Scandinavian country. And uh, his name was like Nils Nilsson or Lars Larsen or... Joseph Johansson or something like that. But he was an expert on expertise. The question he was, and he's published, he's world renowned, it was a fascinating, fascinating guy. And he was talking and consulting with us on what does it take to become an expert on something. And, um, <laughs> and so it was a polite dinner until the moment I spoke. Um, there was, it was a long table and I was kind of down towards one end. And we were eating, and he was talking about pattern recognition and how many times you have to repeat something before you yourself become an expert. And uh, so mid-bite, he was in his mid-bite, I said, so in other words, it's like sexing chickens. 
And he went, ah, and set his fork down and said, yeah, exactly like that. He said, you read my book. And you had to admit you were surprised. <laughs> I hadn't read his book. I just knew a lot about sexing chickens. Um, and what I'm talking about is when chicks come out of the eggs, you can hold their tail up and look, if you're really good at it, and tell, that's a rooster, hen, hen, oh, hen, rooster, with great deal of accuracy. If you ask a chicken sexer, what do you see? They'll say, I cannot tell you what I see. So, what you have to do to understand, does anybody know anything about sexing chickens? I'm curious. I mean, there are some unusual people here. Robert, I know you're a... The, um, what you have to do is deconstruct, and this is, this is the lesson, it, which is people make interesting and uh, brilliant decisions sometimes. You have to ask them, okay, stop, time out, sit down, please. Deconstruct this. How did you make that decision? And what we find out with chicken sexing is that they actually start looking underneath the, I won't go into the details. I didn't have a picture of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> they start looking under the tails at about day eight after hatching. And there's differences then that can be said, oh yeah, that's a hmm, and that's a hmm. And then, and then, and then they back it down to seven, and da day six, and day five, and day four, day three, day two, until they can finally do it on day one. And so it's fascinating. And, they, and then they get to a point where they can't, they can't tell you what it is, but they know that there's a difference there, and this is what it is. So my point is, uh, it's like Marty Tarnowski, a gal I worked with in Seattle for many years. I'm a plotter. I have to go through decision-making one step at a time to kind of reach methodically a conclusion. Marty Tarnowski, she was such a fascinating decision-maker. She, she finally went back to her original maiden name, Tarnowski. I guess you only ever have one maiden name. Tarnowski, after having four marriages. So she wasn't very good at picking husbands, but she was really good at work, at making decisions. And she would be one of those people that would, she would see the whole end game in a flash. So we were such terrific colleagues, because I'd say, okay, Marty, indulge me. You've seen in the flash, I'm eventually gonna catch up with you to figure out how you got there. And then we would meet in the middle, and it was a wonderful decision-making duo. Um, but do you see that difference in how people make decisions? Ask and deconstruct decisions, because somehow, uh, particularly the ones that are the good ones, or deconstruct the ones that didn't work out, and you, uh, you'll, you'll get such great learned lessons. Sumo wrestlers. The, um, my brother Dick, although he moved to New York and he became Richard, um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a story there. Um, he told me that samurai warriors back in the day, whenever they were, ex and then the sumo wrestlers picked up, when they would fight, they would open their mouths to pick up, because they wanted to be able to react very quickly to the advancing move, the advancing threatening move of their combatant. And if they had their mouth open, it was one more source of visual acuity, auditory acuity, where waves, even though you couldn't see them, waves came even with the first flinch of the muscle. But my brother Dick, it's, it's a bunch of crap, uh, I think. <laughs> I suspect it is. Everything else he ever said has been. Um, but I understand what he was getting at, and, uh, which is you keep your eyes and your ears open. You deconstruct. You watch. And, uh, and then you won't uh, get beat up in a sumo wrestling ring. Okay. This is fascinating. When I was in medical school at the University of Minnesota, I did my neurology uh, rotation at North Memorial Hospital. And there was one of my professors there named Abraham Baker, A.B. Baker. And he was, he, was, he was somewhat of a daunting figure. Um, he was the one that wrote our textbook, our two-volume textbook of neurology that we used then. So, uh, so I showed up the very first day. It was one of my early clinical rotations. So I was dutifully standing because I evaluated a young patient on the unit. And Dr. Baker came in and said, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Norman, nice to meet you. 
And I said, nice to meet you, Dr. Baker. He said, uh, what would you like to talk about today? And I said, I'd like to present a patient to you I've just evaluated. He said, okay, I'll stop you at, during, at various times during your presentation. I said, great. I mean, you are Dr. Baker after all. Um, so he said, so I said, he said, okay, why don't you go ahead and begin? And I, I, I said, okay. Uh, this young woman, 27, he said, stop. What does she have? I said, uh, what do you mean? And he said, no, based on just what you've seen or what you've said and observe around you at this moment, what does she have? I said, I haven't said much. He said, no, no, stop, stop. He says, who are you standing in front of? Then he can do this. I said, well, Dr. Baker. He said, okay, so a neurologist. You're on a neurology unit in Minnesota. Okay, yeah, good. You keep on coming there, <laughs> Mr. Norman. And, um, he, and he said, well, he said, well, it's a 27-year-old woman. He said, okay, so just think about it. 27-year-old woman, Northern Tier State, Minnesota. Uh, I think I said a white woman, actually. He said, what's her diagnosis? And I said, it's multiple sclerosis. I think anyway. He said, of course it is. Because, you know, that what else would be in a, what other 27 year old white female in Minnesota would be in a hospital on a neurology unit in front of the great Abraham Baker? Um, and uh, he was right. He said, however, now that you've done, now that you know this, do not rely on and do not reach premature closure and premature decisions. But he said, you have to listen, you have to watch and see everything. You, before you even see the patient, if she's walking down the hall, you already have an opinion you're starting to form. And I think it was a terrifically valuable message. And then run the tape, uh, I don't know, 20 years later, I was in my clinic and watching a pregnant woman, a patient of mine, walk down the hall, and my nurse, Kathy Hershey, looked over and said, oh, she's got MS. And I said, no, that's a pregnant waddle. I've seen it many times. She said, no, but she didn't have it last month. You know, and she was right. Her undiagnosed MS was exacerbated by her pregnancy, and Kathy was right. I said, so Kathy, deconstruct, dump your head sideways, and tell me, how did you come to that? And it was exactly what I just described to you guys. The next one is fascinating. Um, Andrew Kwok, um, he was a young guy I took care of, and I took care of both of his patients, uh, sorry, both of his parents in Seattle, and uh, great fun. His dad, he, he was an ancient Chinese man with this long Fu Manchu looking mustache and beard in a wheelchair, gnarled up, hands just deformed. And, uh, and when I got him, I, I wanted to examine him once. It's kind of a novel idea. He had hypertension, a few things. So I got him out with a great deal of assistance and laid him back on, his, on the exam table. And he was just as contorted, like he had just lifted right out of the wheelchair. You know, he was just as bent. Uh, that was okay. So, um, his, so finally Andrew said, I'm going to get to his mom in a second. Um, Andrew said, I said, he said, what can we do for my dad? And I said, and he had really stained fingers from smoking for, he was like in his 90s or something. And I said, uh, why don't you have him stop smoking? <laughs> I had to say something. <laughs> So he said, okay. So he talked to his dad. He was the interpreter, the son slash interpreter. And he came in about, I didn't see him next month, but about two months later, and he came in walking with a cane, but kind of walking. And I said, holy crap. Um, and uh, examined him. It was a wonderful visit. I said, what happened, Andrew? Because he said, he said, Doc, this, my dad hasn't walked for like 10 years. He's been in a wheelchair for 10 years. And I said, he said, all he did is stop smoking. And I said, really? <laughs> and he said, yeah. He said, you know, I thought after 60 years of smoking opium that he would have a hard time kind of withdrawing from it. But he's really, and he was pink. He looked great. And uh, I said, <laughs> So I remember thinking, that one of life's lessons there is you cannot make any assumptions. He'd been wheeling himself down to the International District and with these gnarly fingers lighting up opium for the last 60 years. And uh, I guess it worked. Um, he was a very happy man. But then Andrew's mom, 
uh, men had a, a chronic hepatitis. We called it non-A, non-B back then, which was, of course, probably hepatitis C. And she was the nicest lady, took care of her for years, and uh, she had finally seven years after, in the, like the seventh year I was taking care of her, said, in Chinese to her uh, son, would you kindly tell the doctor something? She hadn't said anything for seven years to me. And he said, oh, sure, Mom, what? Would you tell the, kindly tell the doctor that I don't have a liver, I am my liver. I am my spleen, I am my heart, I am my brain. Because I was talking to her in a non-holistically way, a non-holistic way. And, and it was so enlightening, maybe humbling, to have this nice, nice old lady remind me of the holistic approach for, you know, because as a physician, as a nurse, as a respiratory therapist, you know, we are their leaders. And to think not of them as a sum of their parts. And uh, that was a valuable lesson. Okay. How to think. You are what you read. I'm, I don't much read management or leadership lead, uh, literature. Um, probably my favorite one, though, is from 1513. Um, Niccolo Machiavelli, when he wrote The Prince, I think is still wonderful leadership lessons. How many have ever read The Prince? It's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one that is, it's probably in high school you read it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, chapter five, when I, I, you know, I've been here at KU for nine years, and when I was hired, Irene Page was uh, CEO, but she was only here for about three months, and then she resigned to, for her new position in Chicago. And uh, chapter five, oh, so Bob Page became my boss then. And uh, he still is my boss, actually. Um, but I remember thinking, oh, God, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli has something to say about this. Because what in chapter five of The Prince is about leadership transition. And what Machiavelli, see, Machiavellian was not ruthless. You, know, you hear about Machiavellian in the, as an adjective almost. He wasn't particularly ruthless. He just wrote down what he saw around him. He was like a reporter, sort of. He was at the same time as Leonardo da Vinci, by the way, the contemporary of, and they actually knew each other. So I remember thinking three months into my new job, well, we'll see how this plays out, because you know, the CEO that hired me was gone, therefore. And, and what Niccolo Machiavelli said was, you know, there's, when there's a leadership, he was talking about kingdoms or dukedoms, uh, and he said, you know, let's compare and contrast Turkey with what is now Turkey. It wasn't called Turkey back then. The, the country of Turkey, I'm not talking about the bird. The country of Turkey with, with Italy. Italy was, had a lot of small fiefdoms, dukedoms, kingdoms, and each kingdom dukedom had its own army. It had its own power structure. Turkey, or whatever it was called back in the 1500s, was, there was a grand poobah, I'm not sure that's the right term, but let's call it that, grand poobah, and then there was peasants. And the, the uh, grand poobah had the army to enforce his will. So what Niccolo Machiavelli said was, when the leadership dies, changes, killed, whatever, a new, and you come into your new role. So I was coming into my new CMO role. Um, you know, I was worried, or I'm sorry, Bob was coming into his new CEO role. The question comes up, and Niccolo asks this, in Italy, are you better off as a new king to take all the lords and embrace them, have them, because they're like middle management, sort of. They've got their own armies, they've got their own people to help. He said, if you enlist them well, then they can be your best friends. And he said, in Turkey, it's not an issue, because there's the Grand Poobah, and it's not even a question to ask, because you, as the new Grand Poobah, you own the world of Turkey. He said, what I've seen in Italy, is you, if you come in as a new king, you're better off to kill them all. You know, he says, because they're gonna be your undoing. They've got their own armies, they've got their own power base. So I remember thinking to chapter five, so I went and said to Bob, I said, so are you gonna hire all new people now that you're the, the new Grand Poobah? And he said, um, not sure. <laughs> no, uh, he said, no, I, he said, I'm gonna stick with you. So that was good. 
Uh, but it's fascinating. Uh, I think some of the best management literature and best learnings come from, you don't read the newspapers if you want to look for good management and leadership. You look at history books. Uh, this, this other one is one that was great, uh, 1991. I'm sure many of you have read Getting to Yes. It's a wonderful book on negotiation. And uh, it was, uh, I, I even used it with my kids. It was in 91, so I must have given it to my daughter, Erin, when she was uh, 13, because that was the year before she got her tattoo when she was 14. And, but she read it. It's, only, it's a very short little read, and I'd recommend it to everybody. So I said to my daughter, Erin, one day when I noticed this little healing scab on the back of her throat, or sorry, the back of her neck, I said, oh, Erin, you have a, she had just gotten out of the shower and was watching television. I looked and I said, oh, you have a wound. And she said, don't be dumb, Dad. That's a, uh, that's a, ta it's a healing tattoo. And I said, and of course, you, you always put on the parental face like, oh, honey, we didn't talk about this. And she said, okay, well, let's walk through that. Where would that have gotten us? <laughs> I said, oh, God. I should not have given her that book. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, honey? Buying time. And she said, well, where would that have gotten us? I'm serious. She said, I, would, I said, uh, Dad, I'm going to get a tattoo. And, and what she'd do, and then she mocked me. Or no, she mimicked me. Well, she mocked me. <laughs> she said, well, what she'd say is, well, honey, you know, uh, that's, they're permanent. And that'd be like putting on a pair of bell-bottom trousers in 1967 and wearing them your whole life. <laughs> And uh, you're going to try to talk me out of it on the basis of its permanence. And I said, okay, yeah. Uh, and I said, uh, and then she said, and then you would have gone to the health things. Like, you know, you can get HIV and hepatitis B and things from dirty needles. And, I, and then I said, yeah, I would, have, I would have said that pretty much. And she said, okay. And then I would have, we would have gone through that whole thing and I would have gotten it done anyway. And then I would have been openly disobedient. As it is, all you can accuse me of is being wrong or misinformed. So I said, <laughs> okay, done. <laughs> what more could I have done? So, so I got, uh, but it led, there were other negotiations that went better <laughs> than that one. Okay. On the continuing column of how to be. This is a year ago today on the right. Now it's me. Uh, I was down doing some army training and being trained and training, and uh, the uh, I was reminded that see I was in the Air Force for 16 years, some of which is on in the reserves, some quite a bit on active duty. And then I got out and I was a civilian for 20 years, and then went back this time into the Army. And I and I thought that the Army was kind of like the Air Force, but it is not. Uh, at all. <laughs> in the Air Force, it's really cool. You go and drop things out of airplanes, then you fly home and sleep in your own bed. Um, and, and in the Army and the Marines, and I don't know, understand the Navy. Doug, that's never made sense. It always seemed pretty... You take your beds with you, yeah, okay. The, uh, the, uh, but the Army, it was fascinating, and I learned it, uh, and that is when you show up for work in an outfit like this, what the difference is, is that somebody, you go up and you introduce yourself to somebody and then they say, you are a soldier first and an officer second, and then they look at your name tag and say, oh, you're a doctor, we need those two. But you are first a leader, and, and this is a great depiction of that, which is you embed with the troops, you are there 24-7, 365, embedded with the troops, leading. And it ain't the Don Trump, you're fired, boss picture up on the top. I guarantee you, you are pulling the sled. And that is a big difference. And I will tell you, one of the things I love about this organization, and I'm talking about KUMC, KU Hospital, UKP, you guys, these guys, is we have a bunch of terrific leaders that lead by pulling the sled. And... That's a big difference from a lot of places where people sit behind the desk and bark commands to the credit of the people that I work with, many of you. That, I had, that was a hard uh, month. My friend Mary and Robert and Mary, my friends here, 
I had 60 pounds of gear on that whole month. It was very cold. I have an M16, an M9 Beretta. My left uh, pouch there on the, under my left hand is chemical warfare gear because they kept throwing stuff at us. It was gas that we had to try. And all I was kept saying was, can I just take out that chemical warfare gear and have a martini shaker in there instead? <laughs> <laughs> no such thing. Okay. One of the things I want to talk about is fairness, because one of the things that is such an important bedrock I've learned uh, in being a good leader is fairness. And, and the reason I say that is when we work in, and rub elbows with our people around us, when we display fairness to somebody else, then that person has faith that we're going to be fair with them and with them and with them. And it's really important to be fair. And this is a little experiment of uh, uh, not on a human, as you can tell, but I think it's, you'll find it very interesting. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group, they know each other, we take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Isn't that funny? And uh, so if capuchin monkeys can ascertain what's fair and what's not fair. Don't you think the people around us can recognize what's fair and what's not fair? I think it's pretty poignant. And, uh, and you know, when I think about the political campaigns that are going on now and, you know, choosing our next leaders and the next Supreme Court, and, I mean, I just think, and I'm not going to get political on us, but, uh, gosh, I just think it calls out for really steady, fair leadership. Okay, come on. Uh -huh. Oh, there we go. Oop, oop. Okay. Um, just a few more minutes, and we'll have time for questions or comments. One of the things I'd like to, to compliment, I think, what I see in the Army is on a resiliency training, how to be and how to be as resilient. I don't think we in healthcare spend enough time with resiliency training, because we're in a very hard profession, and we're in a hard profession for, year, you know, for many years. And this is something that can be taught and learned. The Army, years ago, uh, went into a partnership with Penn to develop uh, formal training manuals and training processes 
Uh, and I won't go into all these things except to say that it exists out there. Um, and uh, I, of course, one of my favorite is uh, Storman Norman Schwarzkopf, the, force, the general on the right. He was a commander during the first Gulf War. I, was react I had been a civilian for six years, happily practicing my medicine in Seattle when I got reactivated during Desert Storm, which was like, are you kidding me? Um, so I went back on active duty briefly. Fortunately, I didn't go to the Gulf. I just went to all the way from Seattle, all the way to Spokane uh, to backfill for people. But the, the um, self-awareness, we've talked about self-regulation, the ability to self-control, these things, optimism, mental agility, strength of character, and connection. That is how, how well we, we interdigitate and connect with our peers. And I think one of the reasons that we have such a high suicide rate in soldiers uh, when they leave the military is because they lose so much of the connection. And these things, I think we need to spend more time both in other professions like our own and in our soldiers and sailors and airmen and whatnot to get out because they, it's like they're severed from their, their, their ties that hold them together with their friends. And, and a lot of it is this thing here, and I work with doctors that have a struggle being um, nice or uh, adjusting well and getting along. And... Uh, and one of the things we do is work through what is the event that triggers whatever thoughts and then leads to some kind of maladaptive actions. And sometimes it it's can be very beneficial for having, and I do this with people, have them log in when they feel something kind of arising inside them before they blow up. Uh, like I had one doctor that I worked with um, who has just done great, who uh, he said, anytime I run a quality assurance meeting, when I run it, somebody leaves crying every time, the meeting, and when somebody else runs it, it, they, it doesn't happen. And uh, while, while that might be a blinding flash of the obvious that maybe you're the uh, catalyst of sad <laughs> crying, it, sometimes people aren't analytic about their own feelings. I love Norman uh, Schwarzkopf because uh, one of the things he said, somebody, I saw him on a talk show once, and he, somebody asked him, he said, well, General, is it true that uh, orchestrating a battlefield is like choreographing a ballet and he said it's absolutely like that until somebody jumps on the stage with an AK-47 and starts shooting and then you have to make certain adjustments so uh, one that's back to the agility <laughs> the mental agility is you have to be willing to make adjustments and not only saying the show will go on we have to adjust a little bit some fun stuff now. Um, I, I spent three years in the Arctic of Alaska, way up there, in the, which is 2,000 miles from Seattle and 4,000 miles from Kansas City. That was the, the view out. I flew 60-some uh, flights up into the Arctic, working with the Eskimos up there to put in a health system. It was fascinating. Um, I, I wintered over the first winter up there. That's the Alaska Range out of the right side, obviously, of, a, of a, an Alaska um, cargo plane. I flew up there in cargo planes about 60 times and, and to help them put in a health system in these very remote subsistence villages. Great fun. I learned some things. Where I, uh, I don't have a pointer. It, well, I guess maybe I could, I could be modern and use right up here, the Kotzebue Sound. This is the area I was working with, the Northwest Arctic Borough, about 90 miles from Russia. No comment on Sarah Palin. Uh, 90 miles from Russia, Arctic Ocean up there. Uh, was putting uh, helping and putting clinics, very fascinating. Uh, one of the, let me go back one just for fun. One of the towns I worked in was uh, Point Hope, which is right here. It's a whaling village. Uh, I took those two photos, and you've, if you've been to my house, you've seen those. That's uh, Kathy Rock is a little girl on the left. She's older than that now. And on the right is a skin boat, three uh, bearded seals, Ugruk, uh, donated their lives to build that boat. And that's on the first day the sun came up in March of whatever the year that was, I can't remember now. Curiously, the, those Eskimo men that are out there getting, they're spotting whales because they want to shoot whales because they eat them. Um, they wear white be, be, because they, uh, they don't, they don't want to scare it. So that when the whales come up with like an eye above the water, they, they, they want to look like floating uh, ice flows. So... Uh, the downside of that is, is that walruses will try to crawl up into the boat because they think it's an ice flow, and there's been more than a few people killed from that. But that's a little sidebar. It's kind of fun. But it's a great spot. I mean, this little town I went into, nice people, no parking on Thursdays, okay? Uh, just like a little negotiation going on there. 
everybody needs a few caribou heads just in case, you know. I mean, and then that was uh, up on the right, bright sunny days. Then the light didn't show real well here, but that's that was noontime, and uh, that was as bright as it got on that particular day. But the, it was a godsend. There was pretty good espresso, Arctic Blues espresso, and then there's a little bench there that says "Husband's Waiting Bench." Uh, so I don't know. Really nice people. I, I helped set up a a program up there called Arctic Care. I was up there in 2005 and again in 2010 where we did a tri-services deal with Army and Navy and uh, Air Force that we would go out to the villages and do everything from pet neutering to colonoscopies of humans um, and, um, and all things between mammograms. It was a fascinating program and I got to hook rides with these Blackhawks uh, out to Selawick and Norvik and some of these little towns. It was because uh, he didn't have much in the way of clinical services up there. It was a great opportunity. And, uh, and I'm going to get to a point in a minute. But I did, I did uh, fish gutting contests. I didn't have one of the duck plucking contests. That was another one. I wasn't very good. That's what an igloo is, by the way. That they don't, igloos, you know, you think about icebox, but the, these, these are in, in Upiat or Inupak Eskimos. That's what they consider an igloo to be, which is basically a sod house. And then just really nice people. She's actually, uh, Vika is actually a Russian Eskimo, uh, speaks Russian. But, but the, what I learned up there, and I learned it, uh, uh, you'll see in another slide again here recently, is how to be in Alaska, and, and I think it's true everywhere, patient, quiet, and listen. And I think one of the things that we feel so much pressure about as leaders is to be smart, to make brash pronouncements or something, when in reality what we really need to do, I think, is just calm it down a little bit. And Winnie, you've been talking about this stuff for years. Just, just relax, be patient, quiet, and listen. The Aaka, or Nana, the grandma on the left, uh, invited me, that, that's whitefish, or shefish, S-H-I-I -I fish, shefish, uh, that they're drying out. This Nana asked me over, there were three generations, I've been up there long enough that they said, it's time you get an Eskimo name. I said, okay. Um, because some of the Eskimo names aren't very flattering. Uh, and I, there's always a certain risk with that. Like one of the guys I worked with up there, his, uh, his uh, nana gave him the name that was like, there are impossible Eskimo names, words, because they're not Indo-European. You know, it's got characters we don't recognize. But I said, so his name is Peter Goodwin. I said, Peter, what is your name? What is your Eskimo name? He said, blah, whatever it was. And I said, what does that mean? He says, you walk bow-legged just like your grandpa. <laughs> you know? So I thought, well, okay, I better be on my good behavior. Um, I'm going to go get an Eskimo name. So, I, so Nana, um, and then there was three generations of women that invited me over for dinner you know, of caribou stew, which was very good. And the, the Eskimos are extremely quiet people. And, like, I worked with one guy named Chester Ballot. And Chester, his, he was like in his 60s. The only time he'd ever been out of the Arctic was when he was carrying an, uh, a weapon in Vietnam. He was drafted, went to Vietnam for 18 months in the jungle, and then came back to the Arctic. You know, imagine that, sh that shock. But he was my uh, teacher, a sense, in a sense there. And if, if I was sitting with Chester and a bunch of other local folks, and I'd say something that was bad, dumb, stupid, wrong, whatever, this is, this is as loud as he got. He'd, he'd do this. And in case you missed it, let me do it again. <laughs> and I say, and I learned that was, it. Um, I learned, I said, after a while I said, Chester, you don't have to yell. I'm right here. <laughs> I mean, I, said, well, I want to make sure you got it, Doc. <laughs> so anyway, uh, my name was, my Eskimo name was Kugruk, K-U-G-R-U-K, which is actually the name of a river, but the Arctic or trumpeter swans get their name from this because they're just thick on this river. And I thought, well, Mia was Nana's grandma, uh, granddaughter. And I said, That's, I could have done worse. Um, and she said, I said, what does that all mean? And she said, well, you're the whitest white person she's ever seen. <laughs> and, and Nana, she's a very black Eskimo, very dark, dark. And I said, well, I can't do much about that. You know, I haven't ever had, had a tan, and my hair is as white as it. And I said, I could have done worse. And she said, we're not done yet. <laughs> I said, okay, what's next? And she said, well, just trumpeter swans and kugruks are just very gregarious. She said, you just 
apparently talked all evening. I didn't say six words. I was so attentive. I said, good, good evening, and then, mmm, love the stew. And then I said, goodbye, and she said, the, the rendition was I was as gregarious and noisy as these honking swans, you know. <laughs> it's like, damn, I, I may be a little bit extroverted, but I didn't deserve that. Um, <laughs> And I said, well, okay, whatever. She said, I'm not done yet. <laughs> and when I went up there, I made it a point. These are poor people. They don't have a lot of resources. So I would wear just the cruddiest clothes, blue jeans, and old boots and whatnot. And uh, she said, you, were, you know, kugruks are prone to excessive preening. <laughs> and, you know, like they're always kind of... And... Uh, I said, did she say that? She said, no, but she said, you better watch out because <laughs> you look like the kind that could be prone to that. So I've, I've been very careful ever since not to do excessive preening. Same thing in Haiti. I, I learned, I was there in October. This is a market, a typical market, uh, just after just a normal daily rain there. And I remember thinking with all the disease and pestilence and everything there, oh my God, we've got to learn how to adjust to a new environment. This lady on the right was another one of these patient, quiet, and listen, I, she's a voodoo practitioner, which voodoo, Haitian voodoo is different than New Orleans voodoo. It's, it's more of like an earth religion. And I sat with her one afternoon and as we were doing some working in this community. And it, it looks like I wasn't very accepted in that photo. It's like, because I have this picture in my office, like, you know. And, uh, but she was very kind and warm and accepting. And I just am reminded as leaders, we just have to dial it back sometimes and be a little bit more patient, listen, listen, listen. Probably the best lesson I ever learned was from a, a Betsy Beard, a patient of mine, and she's a pharmacist in Seattle. Uh, she, and I told her I'm using this as an example. She's this coxswain at the back, right here. She was an Olympic gold medalist uh, on the rowing, women's rowing team. And she said, I was talking to her one time, uh, and she said, I said, what did you, have you learned about from you know, being an Olympic gold medalist and all the run up to that? And she said, my job is to you know, bark out helpful commands and to put as little drag on that rudder, on a, on a shell boat like that. There's a small rudder back there, and it'll, it, you don't want to overly trim it because it'll make it so that it slows people down. You can't do that. Ditto, this guy. I saw him conduct here a year ago. I saw a video uh, interview with him, and during the practice, he is flailing like crazy so that in the performance... Subtle, subtle, delicate. You practice, 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 so you don't have to flail your arms. I drove one of these guys one summer, and I, I learned to follow the advice of others. I said to Spider Lockhart, my guy who taught me, how do you know how much crown to put in a road? He said, well, he always had snuff. You just come back in the winter time, and if cars have slid off, you know you had too much crown in the road. <laughs> I said, there's got to be a better way. So I actually replaced the gyroscope because it was broken in the thing. Because he said, oh, you fancy college boys, <laughs> you know. Clear assertive communication. Roger will go. Roger will comply. You hear about, you see in movies, hua in the military. Heard, understand, acknowledge. Heard, understand, acknowledge. My boss in the Army side last week said, Doc, we are meeting with all these generals and everything. We want you to... Doc, I want you to be the belly button of this operation. <laughs> and there's all these very polite people around that, because he's a two-star general, you know. And I said, what the hell does that mean, the belly button of an operation? And he said, oh, that means I want you to run it. I said, okay, well, why don't you say that? Jeez, you know. <laughs> they, they, of course, they're all so dutiful. They, they have a very structured approach to evaluate mission, enemy, terrain, troops, time, and civil considerations. We have a very similar one, I think, on the civilian side from a, co a competitive model. If you think about it, the, an army structured approach of combat is a little different than uh, competition, but I think it's fun to go through the various, a very structured approach so you get it right every time. Am I forgetting anything? And when I'm forgetting anything, change. What's required for change? And Remember this. I'm happy to send these slides out to anybody who wants them, by the way. Vision, skills, incentives, resources, action plan, 
Those things are all required for change. It's just a normal change model, but you people forget that you have to have these things lined up. If anything's missing, it will stall out. And it's really an, important to look at it from an analytic side. Last comments. Uh, enjoy your own personal pilgrimage and have fun along the way. Uh, th I took a uh, walk along the, it's called the um, Camino de Santiago de Compostela. It's a, the, it's a pilgrimage trail that goes from La Puy, France to, to uh, the relics of St. James. Uh, in, uh, along, it's kind of in the Basque regions. And the, um, I, I, took a, I got on a kick of reading Basque literature, and I wound up in this little town of St. jean Pied de port France. I, I was so sick. I got there, and I, had a, I, had, I don't know what my fever was, but I about died. And I remember, as a matter of fact, I was in that hotel. It was Hotel of Pyrenees. You see the beautiful mountains. People speak Basque. I couldn't understand anything anybody was saying. And, uh, and I, said, I, went, I said, I need a room. And they said, uh, it's 250 euros. I said, okay, I'm going to die anyway, so I might as well die in a good spot because I had a, such a bad headache. I think I must have had encephalitis or something. And, um, but I didn't die. But I woke up the next day and felt really good. I went down and had actually early in the morning a beer and a pizza. Uh, the next morning, but I remember thinking, this this kind of pilgrimage, this kind of walk, nourishes me. I'm glad it. If I was going to die, it was in a really great place. But I'm glad it didn't happen that day. So go forth with great enthusiasm. Uh, there's a, be open and attentive and alert because these life lessons are everywhere, and, and they are eventually what will nurture uh, you along the way. So thank you very much. We uh, don't really have time for questions, so we have one little contest. Uh, the first person who can uh, give me um, Dr. Norman's middle name will have uh, lunch with uh, Dr. Norman, Dr. Cox, and me and talk about leadership or basketball or whatever you want. That's his first name. Middle name. Did you hear it yet? No, I didn't hear it. I'm not going to have to go. Alan, who did it? Okay, give your name to Marty and we'll arrange lunch. <laughs>